Hi, my name is Bill Otson. I live in Medford, Oregon, and I have lived in Medford, Oregon my whole life. I have had many encounters with these beings known as Sasquatch. Starting in the mid-90s to current day, at some point in the early 2000s, I decided to go do some research and find out what these beings are. During my studies, I found an organization of Bigfoot researchers. At first, I thought I was doing the right thing. I was looking in the right direction. The director of the organization took a liking to me and asked if I was willing to become an investigator. I accepted. Within that time frame, I learned a lot of things, but nothing really answered my questions. As I said before, I've had many encounters as an investigator. I handled a lot of reports, and the majority of those reports consisted of seeing Bigfoot crossing roads, loud creams and howls in the distances, having things thrown at them or towards tents and cabins. These are all common encounters that lots of people experience. It wasn't until my face-to-face -face meeting with one of these beings. It happened on October 29, 2010, a day I'll never forget. I was hunting black-tailed deer. The wind was at my favor, and it was slightly drizzling rain. I believe I caught this thing off guard due to the weather. At first I was in complete and utter disbelief that a six-foot-five female juvenile Sasquatch stood directly in front of me, twenty-five yards tops. There was no doubt in my mind. I knew exactly what I was looking at. It was not a buddy in a ghillie suit. It was not a tree stump. It was not a dead snag tree. It was a Sasquatch. And there is nobody in this world that is going to tell me otherwise. And like you, I do not give a damn. What people have to say about what I saw, I know exactly what I saw. I do believe that the knowledge that I did gain as an investigator helped me to understand what I'd seen. If this had been in the 90s, I would have shit my pants and ran from the woods screaming like a girl, not saying that the encounters they had in the 90s didn't scare the shit out of me. I'm saying that those encounters were as real as the Sasquatch I saw standing in front of me on that October day in 2010. Anyway, shortly after that experience, I stopped doing investigations. I had my answers right there in front of me in the flesh that morning of October 29th, 2010. Had I not had the experience, and the knowledge I have learned as investigator. I don't think I would have been able to deal with it. I'd be a liar if I said it doesn't mess up my hunting today, really because I'm always looking over my shoulder when I am out in the woods, and I firmly believe they're always there. Yes, they are. Unfortunately, that sucks and I'm gonna put myself about 300 yards away from where a guy got screamed at just a month ago. Anyway, back to the story, that's a brief description of the encounter. But I think you get the idea in your own experience. You know enough to understand the situation I was in that day. Needless to say, I spent the remainder of my day with a buddy of mine doing ranch work instead of hunting. And with all my experience and knowledge that I've gained as an investigator, I was still shaking today when I hunt. I don't stay as long as I used to. I wish I could give you more details, but I'm afraid that it's just not enough space for me to write down every encounter I've had. That's not to mention, I still have many friends in the research environment, 
but it is one of the most ruthless cutthroat shows I've ever seen, as well the one of the most self-serving environments I've ever got sucked into. I am glad to be out of that complete asset show of yards. There is a percentage of researchers out there and organizations that would be nothing. They would love nothing more than to copyright everything that are Bigfoot so-called experts. But I can tell you from experience within that realm, what you're doing is helping those that need it most as an investigator. I consider myself an advocate to those who had encounters, to these things they didn't understand, and I was glad to help them the best I could. I think of those witnesses often. I am glad that I could give them a little piece of my understanding, and to encourage them to educate themselves and not to listen to the masses of bonehead researchers. They couldn't find their ass with both hands and a flashlight to light the way. Now by posting these emails and reading them, what you're doing is being an advocate for those who want to understand what the hell these damn things are, why they are, and where the hell do they come from. And why in the hell are we not informed? Yet yeah, cheers to that one brother. I don't know if you read this on your cast, but if you do, I don't give a shit if you use my name. My name is Doug Erickson. I'm a retired Minnesota game warden pilot. My patrol area was in the northeastern part of the state, which is mostly wilderness. Feel free to use my name because like you, I don't take crap from people either. I hope that keeps spilling over to everybody. Nobody should take crap from anybody okay. So sometime in the 1980s, I was trolling a very large lake in my patrol area. Because it was such a nice day, I had decided to tie up the boat on the shore and walk across a peninsula to observe any fishing activity in the next bay. I spotted a man still fishing in a boat about a hundred yards out from me. I concealed myself and sat down he did not move. Once I put my binoculars on him to see what he was up to, within a moment he started fidgeting and looking all round. He had his back to me, he turned and looked directly at me. I was completely hidden so he did not hear or see me. He started his boat and came to shore about 30 yards down the hill from me started looking around under brush and behind trees. I thought that he must have hidden pile of fish somewhere. I decided to let him pick them up before I picked him up. He looked from side to side back to where I was and all round. After a few moments of this I realized he was looking for me. I was startled by this, but also very curious he walked around and started to get further away. I mentally told him to come back, and he did so each time, until he walked to the bush in front of me and spread it apart. He looked right at me. So I said, how you doing? And he said, I knew someone was watching me. I said, let's have a seat and let's talk. We soon discovered that we were both army vets, and he said that he found he had the skill while in Vietnam, and it saved his ass many times. I have felt the sixth sense many times when working, and always took it as a warning to get the hell away and find another route. What this guy did was amazing. 
He knew I was not dangerous. I forgot to check his fishing license after feeling that handshake was more and harder. How freaking crazy is that? How awesome is that? That is pretty incredible. And what a fortunate skill to have. What a fortunate place to be that well in tune with your true natural skills. Wouldn't that be freaking awesome to have that skill? Well, I'm pretty sure we all do. We're just out of touch with it. We've been firmly convinced. We've been conditioned to be out of touch with many skills that we were originally created with. But it just goes to show you though, if these beings, these numerous beings, that are running around out here, they are absolutely in tune with that sixth sense. Whatever sex, whatever number it is, could be their tenth sense for all we know, whatever, but obviously they are in tune. They know when we're coming, they know when we're there, and I have a feeling they know exactly what our motives are. Okay, actually, there is a lot of people out there very intelligent, very versed in these things, and they actually know this. But anyway, I'll tell you the next priority story jumping ahead 30 years. There is still a group of us outdoor types, shoot sporting clays, and we're sitting on the deck of the clubhouse, and the subject of Bigfoot came up. I mentioned that I had doubts about any primate living in the wild in Minnesota in the winter because they lose body heat too fast and the calories needed would not be obtainable. We do get to minus 60 Fahrenheit and colder here. My teammates spoke up and said that he had seen one. He managed a mining supply company and was traveling between towns and had to take a leap. He pulled off side of the road, close to where his hunting shack is, and stopped by a power line. As he was doing his thing, he looked down the hill to a small swamp and saw a huge figure pulling cattails out. After a moment, the figure stopped, turned around, and looked at him. Right again and again, how's that for a common detail? It then ran to a poplar tree, hid behind it, and looked at him from side to side, not realizing that his shoulders were for times the width of the tree. Nobody in the group said a word. Three of us were retired law enforcement. Some were loggers or miners and law cabin builders, all outdoorsmen. I broke the silence and asked where he was exactly when this happened. He said right near Eveleth, Minnesota, close to me in one of our coldest towns. I've never seen or found sign of Bigfoot during my working hours, and if I had, I would have kept my mouth shut until retirement. My friend said that it spooked him, and he told no one except his wife and hunting shock partner, I believe, my friend. I've been a fan of your channel for some time now. Not really that great at the whole social media thing, but I do manage to catch your YouTube videos as they come out. I was interested in your content before you started your Sasquatch material. Knowing you before you include a Sasquatch story has made it pretty easy for me to determine your legitimacy. I live in northwestern Montana. I'm 43, and I've lived my life in the timber. I was raised in a hunting and fishing family. They didn't have much money, so those outdoor activities were a necessity, not just a hobby. Our summers would be full of weekend camping trips, fishing streams, and hiking in the high lakes. The Cabinet Mountain Wilderness Falls were always dedicated to hunting and it was not uncommon to have excused absences from school to pack elk out of some hole. In the winter we snowshoed, trapped, and cross-country skied. I consider myself a fairly good outdoorsman and raising my boys in the same manner. And it was not uncommon to have excused absences from school to pack elk out of some hole. In the winter we snowshoed, trapped, and cross-country skied. 
I consider myself a fairly good outdoorsman and raising my boys in the same manner. Lately with the new popularity of fly fishing, I have to resort to getting access to hard to reach spots to get away from the crowd and find the solitude that I crave. The section of river is about a mile and a half walk from the nearest road. It's a great spot where the river braids off into three or four, depending on the time of year. Different channels will allow me to completely cross the river's west slope cutthroat red bound, rainbow, and bull trout can easily be found at the seams where the currents meet. At the tail of each island made by the separate channels, the way I walk is fairly simple. There's a pretty substantial game trail that's easy to find and leads you to the easiest route. One time walking down there I smelt something. I'd come off the side hill. And as I was crossing one of the manual river channels that had been carved out over the years, I didn't think much of it at first, but I began to feel uncomfortable. I slowed down and began to pay more attention. Within minutes I heard a large animal that appeared to be circling me. It was staying out of sight, but wasn't coming in or going away. It was just moving to the side. I had bears do this before when they were trying to get my wind, and as if on cue, I began to hear a hopping sound. It didn't sound like a bear, but my mind instantly categorized it as such. I began to silently cast myself out, thinking I'd come upon a kill. The smell, I had bear spray and I stayed close to a larger tree that I could attempt to get up. If it came to that, it was pretty thick vegetation, mainly older with occasional lodgepole pine. But within a few minutes the animal was between myself and the route back to the truck. I caught a couple glimpses of brown fur through the brush, noticeably one passing a cat-faced alder that had a limb broken off. After the animal had continued to my right far enough, I began to make my way back out of there. I wasn't in the game trail any longer because I wanted to go straight up the hill to the road and taking the game trail would take me in the same general direction as the animal. I wanted to move directly away from it. Within about 60 feet, I reached a cutback and climbed up it using an alder to help me up. I looked at the alder, I realized it was the same tree I had seen the animal pass in front of. I remember this thing completely covering up that distinctive tree. The alder was leading out at the top of the cut back. If the animal had passed in front of it, covering it up, it would have to be standing at the bottom of the bank. Nothing made sense that would have made this thing much taller than me, as I had to reach over my head to grab the base of the tree to climb the bank. I immediately dismissed and continued out of there with no excitement. A couple weeks later, I went back to the same spot, this time driving much further up the road. I had taken a completely different route avoiding that area by probably more than a half a mile. If it was a grizzly, I convinced myself it was, it wouldn't wander from his kill. Once I reached the river bottom, the same uneasiness came over me. Once I decided to turn around, I began to get vocalized out. It began as a kind of a huff that quickly turned into growling and yelling. It was loud, it was close, I was kind of frozen. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I was looking really hard to pick up on any movement or anything that was out of place when a slight movement caught my eye. I found myself staring at an alder patch with one pine tree growing through it. It was pretty thick, but I had definitely seen movement. Within a few seconds I realized I was looking at a very large hand, gripping the trunk of the pine tree. Once it growled, it was like the whole thing came to view. It was absolutely huge. I had it had an angry expression on his face, and it bared his teeth. Before the next growl, and a yell came out of his mouth. I began moving diagonally towards the direction it had come down the hill. I was very surprised at how something so large could be so quiet. This time I had brought a Ruger 40 for Magnum with me and had it in my hand. Without even knowing I drew it, I took off trying to keep my wits about me in a direction that moved me closer to my truck, but still keeping 50 to 60 feet between us. This continued for what seemed like hours. Every time I would begin to think it was gone, because I hadn't heard it, it would shake, or break a tree, or growl and yell at me. It was terrifying. I felt it would never end. This continued all the way to the road. I popped out where I would have walked down the road in his direction to get to my truck. I seriously thought of going in the other direction, hoping to render someone else. I quickly decided against that and fired three shots at a tree on the uphill side of the road in its direction. I didn't fire on the side of the road it was on I waited what seemed to be an hour. 
but I'm sure it was only a matter of seconds, and began that way, I didn't look at the timber, I just kept my eyes wide, and the hammer geared back on my reloaded pistol, once after I went far enough, where I was going to go around the corner, and lost sight of the section road, I allowed myself to look back, it was standing on the shoulder of the road, maybe 40 feet from me, it seemed to posture up, once I turned around almost in a dominance display, like how a douche bag in a bar will pop his chest up and try to pick a fight, it stomped its foot and let out a horrible yell that rang my ears. It reached over and grabbed what looked to be about a six-inch large tree and bent it towards itself with no effort at all. I couldn't move. It continued this display of beating the crap out of the tree for a few seconds, then got into a slightly stooped posture, turned sideways, took one step out of sight. It was mumbling as it walked off. That's all I could hear, mumbling no footsteps, no twigs breaking, no underbrush rustling, just mumbling, it almost sounded amused. I walked about another quarter mile to my truck, and an out of state jeep pulled up as I was taking off my pack. They asked me how the fishing was. Once they saw the rifle on my day pack, I couldn't get a word out. They took off. Once I turned to the side, and uncoupled my empty holster from my belt. I think the empty holster caused them to notice the pistol on the hood of my truck. I haven't ever said a word of this to anyone other than my wife. I think she believes something spooked me, but not that it was a 10 foot plus bipedal animal. I haven't been back there. I took the family up that river last spring to pick morale mushrooms, but the anxiety I had, my two little boys running around was too much. I wasn't even close to the spot. I've listened to your podcast and other YouTube Sasquatch channels. But a lot of them, a lot of them just seem lonely or bored. They seem like they want attention. Then I'll hear something that'll rub me the wrong way. Like some of these guys that claim to talk to them and that they're furry forest brothers. I don't buy it if it wanted me, it could have had me. I had the pistol. I'm an excellent shot, but I can't help feel I was undergunned for a one shot stop. It definitely didn't want me there and it didn't want to be my friend. I apologize for long email. I just wanted to get it out there. I started out really skeptical when you started off with the Sasquatch stuff, but I really had a good opinion of you and you eventually proved me right thanks Steve and keep fighting the fight look me up forever in my area I want to float around a river shoot. Some gophers thanks. My encounter, year 1993 middle of May. This is only the fifth time I've told this story to anyone outside my family members and the four before you, I've almost been in fistfights, and the people I was talking to would not just walk away cleanly. It was the end of my junior year in college at Arizona State University. My roommate and I secured jobs in the Kenai Peninsula, Alaska, through a good friend of ours who had fished commercial salmon the year before, heading in between Castle and Kenai Rivers. My roommate secured a job with Jeff Ransom, who owned the sites. He passed away the same winter at an avalanche while snow machining in December. I believe Jeff sites were on the mouth of the Kenai River. I did not secure a job until arriving at Homer. I had a job fishing halibut, a 48-hour fish, but I don't know the regulations. Now, the job was with Kevin Duffy, who was Jeff Ranson's brother-in-law. He referred me to Debbie Nakata, who owned the set net sites just south of Jeff's, on the Castle Off Riverside. I'm just giving you the background case you wanted to verify. Deb still lives there in Hawaii in the winter. We started off our track, arrived at the Canadian border, Vancouver, headed on through Whistler, my neighborhood, and the switchbacks in my backyard, up 97 north to Prince George, and then 16 west, and proceeded to hit the 37 Casio Highway. On the map, it was single red line, which means two-lane paved road, not it was 800 miles of two-lane dirt and gravel, so headed north in my two-wheel drive 86 Toyota pickup truck. With over 200,000 miles on it already, we stopped at ISC, British Columbia, to get gas and some food. I've been there a few times. May 28, 1993, it was almost 9 p.m. Summer, around there. I know this because I'll never forget this day. What happened next? I go over it in my head daily. I'm almost 50 now, 
and I was 23 then. I can remember the scent in the air, the scent of the forest that I did not experience in Arizona. It was the scent of pure, clean air. The forest and rain all combined. When we pulled out a gas station, I looked at my truck's clock, and it's at 9 p.m. The sun was on the horizon, not sunset yet. I drove for about two miles and pulled over to the side of the road because I thought I had left my wallet at the gas station. After getting out of my truck, I found it on the floor between my feet. I jumped back in the truck and put it in drive. I was creeping along at first because I was putting my wallet in my bag behind my seat. So I was half turned around while moving forward. So I was only going about 10 miles per hour. My roommate in the passenger seat had his head down leaning forward, taking off his shoes. As I turned and put both hands on the wheel, my focus was back straight ahead. I started to accelerate to maybe 25 miles per hour, went about, I would say at 75 yards ahead from the tree line on my right. I saw what I thought was a grizzly bear. First glance. Exiting the tree line, starting to cross the road. I was about to say grizzly, because at first glance, in a split second, that's what my brain said. But in another split second, as I took my foot off the gas, I saw something larger than a grizzly take its first two steps across the road. On two feet, as I basically froze, my truck rolled forward. The next thing I knew, I slammed on the brakes, sliding a little in the gravel, and as my roommate, who hadn't looked up yet, hit the dash and glove box with his chest and part of his face, I screamed big foot. It came to a halt. My roommate looked up and went silent. When I looked at him, at first, he was staring straight ahead, with eyes more wide open than I thought I'd ever seen before. I looked back ahead and watched the third and fourth steps. It never turned to look at us, and we're at this time, 40 feet from it. The funny thing is, it didn't look at us at all, but the child it was carrying in its right opposite arm, which is high up on its her chest, and its upper torso, was at her shoulder, and it was turned, and looking right at us from behind her head, it was almost peering at us from behind the right side of her head, as his mom walked across the road, it never took its eyes off us the whole way across the road, which only lasted for three or four more steps, her left arm looked very long, as it hanged almost her knees, she wasn't swinging her arm, probably because she was carrying her child. It immediately entered the opposite tree line, and as it did, I accelerated towards her and slammed on the brakes where she entered the tree line. I jumped out of my truck, and my roommate said, don't get out, what are you doing? But in saying that, he had already opened his door and was on his way out as well. I ran from my truck to the tree line and just stood there with my ears facing the trees. I heard an auto sound, so I stood there for five minutes in silence, and never heard a sound. I slowly backed away from the tree line, and I looked up, to recognize the tree she had entered under. I looked at a branch he went under, and that was no way it was any less than eight or nine feet from the ground. We got back to the truck and started driving. After sitting in silence for maybe two or three minutes, my roommate says, did you see that? I said, yes, I did. Did you see the child it was holding? And my roommate said, that was a baby, a human babe. And I said, that was not a human. And he said, no, I didn't mean it like that. I meant, it looked like a human. And I said, yes, it did. It looked like a person. Now my roommate then yelled while looking right at me. What the F? When he said that, Tear started coming from my eyes, so I said why are you crying, and he said I don't know. We drove in silence for the next hour until he said, what are we going to tell everybody? And I said, I don't know, probably nothing. No one will believe us. Because people are idiots, and we talked about the features of the child's face, and the size of its eyes, how it was looking at us, the hair color, the mother's height, the weight, etc. Jebs kept driving the whole summer in Alaska. The rest of that summer, every time I heard a noise in the trees, I would stop and just listen. I can relate to that one. It changed my life forever and have went over in my head practically every day for the last 25 years. Thank you for your channel.